If someone is wise, we think they're great. If someone is smart, we lift them up. But hold on on that just a minute. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemmer. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, taking you from Genesis to Revelation through the Bible in one year. We've done it. This is our 32nd time. We're in the book of Job now. And this is really something. And as we go through the book of Job, Ryan and Corey, uh, they join us. So Corey, what's going on? Well, as I was reading our assigned reading, I noticed that Job begins to use some harvesting language. So we are going to take a look at ancient harvesting today. Ryan? Well, today, to go along with our study, I'm going to be taking a close-up look at the life of the righteous man, Job. All right, very good. Excellent. And Janice? A question for us. What provokes us? All right, take your Bible guide out, turn to today's passage. Let's pick up the Bible, the Word of God, and let's listen to what the Lord is speaking to us. Job 15, verses 1 through 16. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speeches with which he can do no good? Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God. For your iniquity teaches your mouth and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. Are you the first man who was born? Or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsel of God? Do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? What do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray-haired and the aged are among us much older than your father. Are the consolations of God too small for you, and the words spoken gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away, and what do your eyes wink at, that you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth? What is man that he could be pure, and he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? If God puts no trust in his saints, and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man, who is abominable and filthy, who drinks iniquity like water? Job chapter 15, verses 1 through 16. Job chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15 is what we read when we go through the Bible for the 32nd time. You know, we think someone is smart. When we do, we think highly of them. When we think someone is wise, we respect them in a different way. We expect them to understand how to put their knowledge into practice, how to correctly analyze and approach situations. Unfortunately, it is common for people to only come across as wise and still lack understanding that they need. Well, Eliphaz might fairly be put into this category. Eliphaz did not have a right of understanding that was happening to Job, and neither did the other men. Yet rather than keeping quiet, he aired all of his opinions confidently. Now, the reader knows what none of the men did know, that Job was the subject of a test, and God was allowing this test in front of Satan. In fact, Job was being victimized, and Satan hoped that Job would curse God and turn from salvation. But Job did not. You know, it's very interesting, isn't it, how we think and how we begin to process things? Uh, we, we are people that are impatient. And when it doesn't happen like we want it, suddenly we come up with our own ideas and they're often, in fact, most of the time wrong. But let's think about this and let's understand because a wrong accusation can do wrong things and cause a lot of trouble. 
Take your Bible guide. If you don't have one, call us or write to us and we'll send you one or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Click on the page and it will take you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. We trust the work of the Holy Spirit to speak to you and in you. And then it'll take you where you can download it exactly how we printed it. It's awesome. And you, you're seconds within joining us here. Wrong accusation. But Father, I pray today as we open up your word and, and look at this again, we need to hear you. Because Job is such an important book. You know, we're reading through it again. And as we read through it, help us to see things that we did not see before. And help us to learn more as we go along. Because, Father, you're showing us new things every time we go through the Bible. It is exciting. So we thank you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen and amen. Job is a fascinating book. Remember, every philosophy class should read it and consider it. It is amazing. So Job chapter 15 says a very interesting part. Now, this is something we have not studied before, but Job 15 says, Then Eliphaz the Timonite answered and said, Should a wise man answer with empty knowledge and fill himself with the east wind? Should he reason with unprofitable talk or by speechless or be sp by speeches with his, with which he can do no good. Yes, you cast off fear and restrain prayer before God. For your iniquity teaches your mouth and you choose the tongue of the crafty. Your own mouth condemns you and not I. Yes, your own lips testify against you. <laughs> Boy, this is interesting because Eliphaz judged Job by what Job said and did not consider his pain. So listen to this. We must never be quick to judge someone's position towards God. Beloved, listen carefully. Eliphaz was doing the same thing he was accusing Job of doing by commanding curses on him for what he said. You see, we can't do we can't do justice properly when we act like that. We have to trust in God, pray and ask God to fill our spirits and our hearts so we know how to respond to people. Remember, I've said it's easy to act like a Christian, but reacting like a Christian, that's hard. But the Holy Spirit fills us and touches us so we can as we go through life. That's important. Now let's learn more here as we go to Job 15, verse 7. It says, are you the first man who's been born or were you made before the hills? Have you heard the counsels of God? Do you know the limit or do you limit wisdom to yourself? What do you know that we do not know? Or what do you understand that is not in us? Both the gray haired and the aged are among us, much older than your father. Are the cons consolations of God too small for you? And the words spoken, gently with you? Why does your heart carry you away? And what do your eyes wink at? That your turn or that you turn your spirit against God and let such words go out of your mouth. Fascinating. See, Eliphaz accuses Job of using excessive and angry words against God. He's judging his words. Beloved, we may say things through our pain that we do not mean. But you know what? God knows our hearts. There's things we say that come out because our heart is overcome with pain. But down deep in our heart, God knows our hearts, beloved. We, we, we have to remember that when we're helping people and dealing with people and talking to people, especially on social media now like never before. So we must keep in mind that God knows their heart and we must facilitate showing them that the Holy Spirit will help them. <laughs> that becomes very important today in the social media, doesn't it? All right, let's go back to Job 15, verse 14, which says this. What is man that he could be pure? And he who is born of a woman, that he could be righteous. All right, did you see that? What is man that he could be pure? And who and he who is born of woman, that he can be righteous. If God puts no trust in his saints and the heavens are not pure in his sight, how much less man who is abominable 
and filthy who drinks iniquity like water. There's a lot to be said here, but Eliphaz points out the corrupt nature of mortal men. And that's true. Man is nothing, but watch this. Jesus is everything. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you invited him? Let me ask you another question. Do you know Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? As the one who makes all the decisions? I, I want to talk to people who don't know the Lord, and I, I would invite you to pray with me because I'm going to pray. I do it every day, and let's pray. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I am wrong, filthy, and dirty. But you came 2,000 years ago, pure and clean and holy. And we killed you. But on the third day after your death, you rose in the flesh. and You became alive. And you said to us, tell everybody what I did for you. Because you gave us eternal life. So, Father, I pray today, give me eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, be the Lord of my life. And we said together, you and I, and all of us together, amen, make it be so. Amen, let it be so. In Jesus' name, the name of Jesus Christ, the strongest name ever, this is what we pray. Amen and amen. Now, we prayed that. And if we meant it, that changed our life, that meant something. And suddenly, unlike Eliphaz said, we are changed. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Today we read Job chapters 12 through 15, and with that, a study of the life of the man the book is all about couldn't be more relevant. Now, some people, even some professing Christians, believe that Job wasn't a real person. But other biblical references make it clear that he was just as real as Noah and Daniel. Job is famously known for having great prosperity, losing it all, and then getting it back again. It would be a very tough test for this very righteous man. It was approximately 2000 BC, and the man, Job, had the picture-perfect life. He lived in the land of Uz, and was extremely wealthy, wise, and blessed with his wife and ten children. He had great possessions, namely 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. He was considered the greatest of all the people of the East, and was extremely devout to God. Satan, however, was not impressed in the least. When God asks the fallen one to consider his servant Job, who is blameless and upright, and who fears God and shuns evil, Satan, or the accuser in Hebrew, accuses the man of God of having conditional love and loyalty to the Lord. Does Job fear God for nothing, he asks? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Although Job is completely unaware of this otherworldly conversation, God takes Satan up on his challenge and allows him to plunder, kill, and destroy, though he is strictly forbidden from taking Job's life. Satan wastes no time. In a matter of moments, Job loses everything but his life and his wife. Messengers come in rapid succession to inform him of his losses. Sabaean raiders have stolen all of your oxen and donkeys and killed the workers. Fire from heaven has consumed your sheep and servants. Chaldeans have come and taken your camels and murdered your servants. Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. Job's response is most startling. He tears his clothes, shaves his head, and falls to the ground to worship God. He proclaims, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. 
the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Satan, however, is still not satisfied. Take away his health, he says to God, and Job will curse you to your face. When Job is struck with boils, his wife, enraged, says, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job's friends were of no help either, since they believed that he had done something to deserve divine punishment. Though Job grew increasingly impatient with God, he still remained faithful despite Satan's best attempts to destroy that faith. In the end, God rebuked Job's friends and restored everything Job had lost. In fact, he gave him twice what he had before. So the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And after this, he lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. You know, what's so fascinating to me about the book of Job is that Job's main question regarding why the righteous suffer is never really answered. Job openly challenges God with this question, but God responds to Job's challenge by giving a four-chapter monologue regarding his creation and God's governance over it. Why? What's God's point here? Well, I think that the Lord was trying to show Job that Job lacked knowledge, power, and concern to rule over various parts of God's creation. Now, if Job, because of these deficiencies, is not qualified to rule over less sensitive parts of God's creation, how much more disqualified is he to ascertain how God should rule over humanity? And to Job's credit, he acknowledged his limitations and humbled himself before the Lord. That's the attitude that we all should have before the Creator and Savior of the universe. I, I, that attitude, I think, is presented at the end when God begins with his over 80 questions. Mm -hmm as he confronts Job and he begins to ask him these questions. And Job says, I, I know God, you said that I'm gonna answer you, but listen, I can't. And uh, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, we don't think about that in today's, you know, social media context, but we should, because a lot of people say, why doesn't God show up on social media? But wait a minute, if he did, there's nobody who could answer him. Very, very important. Interesting, right? Okay, Corey. All right. Well, I noticed as we, were, as I was reading through our assigned reading, that in Job chapter thirteen, he utilizes the language of harvesting. Let me read it to you. It's Job chapter thirteen, verses twenty-five and twenty-six. He says this to God: "Will you torment a wind-blown leaf? Will you chase after dry chaff?" For you write down bitter things against me and make me reap the sins of my youth. So that the dry chaff and, and the reaping element of this conversation, Job is talking, he's utilizing the language of farming and harvesting crops in order to get his point across. So today, I want to take a look specifically at ancient Israel and how they harvested grains in that time period. Take a look. In the Bible, harvest time is referenced both as an actual practice and as a useful metaphor. Ancient Israel was an agricultural society. Their very survival depended on farming innovations and consistency. So when the time of reaping their produce came, it was an occasion for great celebration and joy as much as for hard work. The production of cereal grains has been called the backbone of ancient Israelite society and was largely composed of wheat and barley. Let's look at the wheat harvest as a model of harvesting and threshing. The wheat harvest took place during the summer and could overlap with the beginning of the grape harvest, making it a very busy and happy time of year. The reaping of wheat came first and could be done by hand or sickle, if by hand the entire plant would be pulled up from the roots. To reap large fields of wheat, whole teams of people would normally be employed. A foreman would oversee the work, and reapers would make their way through the fields armed with sickles of flint or metal, cutting the stalks either halfway, leaving some of the plants still standing as straw for animals to eat or for collection for different use. Wheat stalks could also be cut closer to the head of grain to minimize the work of winnowing later on. After the reapers would come teams of young men and women who would organize the cut stalks into piles and tie them into bundles called sheaves. Once the reaping was completed, the sheaves would be carried to the threshing floor. 
The location of threshing floors would likely have varied from area to area as they needed to be in windy locations. Here, the stalks of wheat were turned into three products of varying worth, grain, straw, and chaff. The first step of processing the wheat was to cut the plant up to separate the valuable grain seeds from the plant stalks. This could be done by threshing stick, animal, threshing sledge, or threshing wheel. Threshing sticks wielded by harvesters would be used to beat smaller amounts of grain, maybe even for a quick meal or on products that had smaller seeds. Animals like oxen, with or without metal shoes, could be driven over the plants to crush them into pieces. Effective threshing sledges were also drawn by animals. They were boards inlaid with sharp stones and metal to chop the plants. And threshing wheels were carts made with rows of stone and metal inlaid wheels to accomplish the same. The chopped up wheat was then winnowed. Using wooden fork-like shovels, harvesters would throw the mixture high into the air to catch the wind. The different weights of the products meant that the wind would carry them different distances. The light and nearly useless chaff would be carried the farthest. The straw would fall closer to the harvester and the valuable heavy grain would fall closest to them. The grain would be tossed up for another chance at blowing away remaining chaff and then passed through a few sieves before being measured for taxation and stored for human consumption. So this would have been a really effective way for Job to communicate because harvest the harvesting of grains was something that happened every year. It was very important. It was a very public affair. So him utilizing this language uh, made sure that his message was communicated really effectively to his audience. It's also a little bit ironic because something that is normally uh, so joyful, like the harvesting of crops, he flips on its head and instead he's saying that essentially he is the chaff and that and that he is being made to reap the sins of his youth, which is unfair, uh, you know, when we're looking at his overall argument because he has dealt with those sins in the way that God has prescribed him to. So it's it's a really great use of language here for Job. That's excellent, Corey. Very good. Janice? Yes, I called this What Provokes Us because I took a look at chapter 15 that Rod was zero, zeroing in on today. And, you know, we hear Eliphaz, he spends the whole chapter making uh, um, accusatory remarks about how foolish Job is. And then after all of that, in chapter 16, we hear Job answering Eliphaz, really all of them that were had been talking to him up to this point. And here's what Job says. I have heard many such things, miserable comforters are you all. Shall words of wind have no end? Or what provokes you that you answer? What provokes you that you answer? Verse 4. I also could speak as you do, Job says, if your soul were in my soul's place. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Listen to what he says. But I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. It's very easy for us, isn't it? Sometimes we think that, and I'm talking to myself here, right? I'm not preaching at you. I'm talking about the way we are. And oftentimes we want, we see somebody's rough situation and we want to be able to solve that problem. We want to be able to solve it for them. We want the pain to go away. We, we get concerned and, and confused within ourselves and we want to, to solve that situation. Is that what provokes us to answer? That we think that we need to come up with their solution? Well, we don't know the whole story. We don't know sometimes. Now, there are times in our life when the Holy Spirit will speak very clearly to us and give us the right words to say at the right time. And I'm gonna tell you something really personal um, at this moment. When Rod and I were uh, first pastoring a church, and I remember we, we did prayer meetings in the evening, I had two women come up to me at the end of service on the Sunday morning, and they said, tonight after prayer meeting, um, I've got, I, I really have to ask you a question. I really need help. Two of them came to me separately, and all afternoon I was so worried about, 
what are they going to ask me? What could they possibly ask me? And what am I going to say? And at the end, near the end of the service, at nighttime, I literally went to the ladies' bathroom and I stood in a stall. I was hiding because I had myself so anxious about how I was going to solve their problem, how I was going to answer them, and what could they possibly say, and what could I possibly give them. And I recognized the fact that if they came in, this was how desperate I was, that they came in, they would be able to see my feet. So here is a grown woman. I got up on top of the toilet and I stood so that if somebody came in, Rod, they wouldn't be able to know that I was there. And in that panicked moment, I heard God speak to me. Why are you so worried? And I was muttering and I was like, God, why, you know, I never wanted to be a pastor's wife and Rod, we, we, never, we, we, we never wanted to do this and here I am in this place and they're going to come to me. And it was just like he waited for me to quiet. And then I felt him say to me, you don't have the answers. You won't have the answers, but you know who does. I have the answers, bring them to me. And when I recognized that, that God does have the answers, that he cares and we can bring God into that situation, I slowly climbed down, I opened the door and I went back out and what I did with my sisters separately was listen to them, join their hands, and prayed with them. We joined together to go to the one who did know the answer. At the end of the program, we pray and, and we say, Lord, I love you for you are who you are, the Holy One and the Great One. And we ask, Lord, that you would be the Lord of my life. Help me today to live as I should. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, come and pray with us on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern Time. That's New York time. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Bible Discovery. You can look up Bible Discovery on Facebook and YouTube. We'll be there.